Hello and welcome back to Newsworld here on Newsroom Africa, Channel 405. Immigration on the African continent has been on the top of, has been on the, top of the agenda during a number of political discussions uh, across the continent. In Libya, many have died attempting to cross the Mediterranean into Europe, uh, while in southern Africa there have been attacks on foreign nationals, uh, which the South African government claims isn't xenophobic. Currently, a group of migrants have been staging sit-ins outside United study uh, on decolonizing immigration, saying it's uh, time Africa looked at its immigration policies uh, to include a pan-African approach. Here to discuss this, I'm joined by Abigail Dawson from Consortium for Refugees and Migrants in uh, South Africa, Comza. Abigail, thank you for joining us uh, on Newsworld. Um, it's unfortunate that we couldn't have Professor uh, joining us in studio this evening to add to this conversation. Uh, but let's talk about that, uh, this pan-African uh, migration policies. What are some of the migration policies uh, that you have come across or that you guys are dealing with as an organization? So I think largely we've inherited a lot of the previous migration policy that existed under apartheid, which was largely founded in ideas of nationalism, identity, race, and economic power. You know, we had large um, migrant labor systems put in place to ensure economic and political power. Um, and, you know, still recently there hasn't been enough shift towards this pan-African idea around migration. Um, most recently, the International White Paper on Migration was written, which we kind of promote. They do take some kind of a pan-African approach mm. in promoting um, free, visa, you know, limited visa requirements and have proposed a SADAC visa. However, the implementation of that is hugely limited. <clears throat> and there's other major issues which I can speak to, which kind of amplify the securitization and it's really will create an unequal development in terms of who are the kinds of people allowed in. It's definitely for skilled, highly, high professionals and not small informal traders or refugees and asylum seekers. And as we know, that's going to be a growing population as climate change really impacts on... Because climate change has a, has a big influence in migration as well. I mean, this is how we know from the beginning of time, so people have uh, ended up in certain parts of the world due to climate change. Climate change is push people to move on. And like you say, it's going to be a huge factor in how people choose to migrate and where they choose to migrate. Why do you think that governments are reluctant uh, to give visas? I mean, we know you're saying you mentioned the static visa and you mentioned that uh, there are obviously uh, rules around this or regulations around this. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there seems to be a preference for uh, skilled people as opposed to just refugees and asylum seekers. Why? Wh why? I think this does stem from a colonial legacy mm. that has, you know, the project of decolonization, which is much more on the agenda now, but has failed in a big way in terms of promoting the movement of people and varied people, not just for their economic or political interest, mm. um, and kind of seeing how movement and mobility has opportunities and benefits for development at mm. a larger level. Right. And, you know, that and I'm sure the professor would have spoken to this, but that our borders were literally made at the Berlin conference in a decision by a group of Europeans. Yeah. I mean, those are, you know, ideologically what that means mm -hmm. for the continent and the SADAC region is huge. And I think it's really pushed mm -hmm. towards the notion of migrants being a threat. Um, and as we've seen that in the kind of political rhetoric and narrative mm -hmm. that is very regularly how migrants are framed as a threat or a burden and that you know that kind of language and the anti-black language that stemmed from apartheid has you know kind of carried on on yeah I mean we talk about the Berlin conference uh, that happened in 1884 and it was literally a bunch of European leaders who had a meeting and they took a pen and they looked at the map and they're like, True, they're lying. you know, they, they, it's, it, it is fascinating to think that this is the legacy of colonization and this is how it began, is they took this pen and they marked on the map whichever parts they wanted and some parts they hadn't even explored, they didn't even know what existed in those parts of Africa and it was all to do with uh, taking advantages of our resources uh, and one would argue 
uh, if the professor was here, he would probably have told us about this, is that, uh, you know, South Africa and I mean, South Africa, Africa uh, is a very mineral rich country, uh, a real continent. Uh, you know, we have many resources. I mean, literally the palm oil greased, uh, when the, uh, greased the, uh, the machines during the Industrial Revolution. I mean, and this is all uh, the legacy of it today, and this is how we're struggling. But what do you think the, the role of migrants is in all of this. I mean, we always look at like the responsibility of governments and countries, but what's the responsibility of migrants or their role in all of this? I mean, there also seems to be a negative connotation to migrants. You mean their role in kind of uh, defending they're... these ideas yes. of securitization and borders? Yes. I think they're in a very difficult position, especially mm -hmm. in a place like South Africa, which is still so hugely you know, we're so framed by nationalism and identity and mm. the kind of nation state. Mm. So you are in a precarious position when you are the minority in a country, mm. um, especially when, and you know, the nation state is such a fixed idea within politics. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, you know, until the policy speaks to that, it is people are in a very difficult position and I think often you know, migrants do have the capacity and it's largely highly skilled migrants who will be recognized for their contribution mm -hmm. to economies. Mm -hmm. um, and as we see in South Africa, the informal economy is huge, but there's been a huge shutdown on that informal economy, which does... People are competing for resources. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we, uh, maybe you can take us to Abigail some of the reasons why people choose to integrate. I mean, we know some of the social reasons and the economical reasons and the political reasons. What would be these reasons? I mean, you... So they are really varied. Um, yeah. You know, in the Sadak region, it's work and um, living opportunities. Mm -hmm. But it ranges since 1998 when the Refugees Act was brought into place. Then we had refugees and asylum seekers seeking safety in South Africa and in the Sadak region. Mm. But what's usually left out of the conversation is business, um, <clears throat> people here for tourist reasons and the immigration mm -hmm. conversation. Mm. What's the brain drain and people leaving South Africa? Um, and then another conversation which I think is hugely neglected in the migration conversation is internal migration. Yes. Johannesburg has the highest population of people from outside the Gauteng province. Yes. And it's really important when you're talking about resources and spaces in hospitals and schools when you have huge internal migration that isn't being spoken about or accounted for and that that migration has been historical and it's very normal for people to move to urban centers. And, then, and in a situation like that, when you talk about internal migration, uh, and then it's, it, it, what, kind of, uh, what kind of framework is in place to, to deal with that traffic coming into, to the, you know, you say it's, 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 it's strain on, on government, on, on hospitals, and it's, strain, uh, it's a strain on everything. I mean, I mean the, and every year there's an influx of people coming into to Johannesburg as well. Let's look at some of the immigration laws, particularly in South Africa. Who do those laws benefit? Do they benefit people uh, wanting to, to immigrate or migrate in? So they, as I said earlier, they are largely more beneficial to highly skilled people. Yes, it's yeah. very difficult to get mm. documented in this mm. country. If you look at our asylum process, mm. we have an <clears throat> I think it's between 96 and 98 percent rejection rate on people seeking asylum in this country. So you have people who are with, in the asylum seeking process for over a decade. Yes. Um, which, you know, is just, it's a really lengthy and hard process. And similarly for other people, you know, the um, Zimbabwe special permit and kind of the restrictions within that and difficulty in being registered online. So. I think, you know, what this international, the white paper on international migration, by speaking to the SADAC visa, is a really progressive way in which we should be thinking about migration in the region, because fundamentally that movement is not going to stop. Mm. And I think that's really the challenge is that we're moving towards a much more closed and securitized system mm. when people are still going to be coming, and how can my migration and mobility be better managed rather than stopped or tried to be prevented. Yeah. I'm also interested to know what happens when you do seek asylum in, in South Africa. I mean, what are your rights as an asylum seeker? What can you do? What can't you do? You, you're just kept at a camp and, and, you know, you're just living day by day. 
waiting for your papers to be processed. Uh, you know, what happens, what, what, is the, what is the story of someone who seeks asylum here? Yeah? So fortunately at this point, and we can really hope that the policy doesn't get um, kind of implemented any further, is asylum seekers and refugees don't, are not kept in camps. And that was, it's been really progressive and recognized internationally that yes. South Africa took a non-encampment policy. Mm -hmm. So you have the right to work and study. That is often very difficult because... Some parts of the world, you don't get, you don't have the right to, to work and study. Yeah, and it is progressive policy, but at the same time, you would want people living in your country to be contributing, mm -hmm. right, and being a part, yes. and fully integrated into that society. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So there are, however policy shifts towards creating what they're calling asylum seeker processing centers, mm -hmm. which they'll essentially keep people at borders until their papers are um, confirmed. However, there's been no cost implication or you know, structure put in place for this. And what that would mean is you're keeping people in what, you know, in other places in the world we know refugee camps can be really detrimental to people's human rights. Mm -hmm. and what is the cost of Human rights keeping, atrocities, I mean, horror stories. And what is the cost of keeping someone in a facility versus enabling them to try and find some form of work or set up some small business? Um, right. And we look in South Africa and we look at the, you know, his recent headlines from this past year about xenophobic attacks. Uh, what has your organization been doing to try and, uh, you know, change the dialogue around that? So as we know, it's not a recent thing. It's yes. been ongoing reports kind of since 2006 and, and 2008 it's, being the, the mm, big one. It's go, it dies down and then all of a sudden it happens again and... Yeah, so it does in terms of like bigger kinds of violence but also that xenophobia is an everyday experience mm. for a large number of people. Um, so our organization, we do larger advocacy work so one of our key things was to engage the Department of Home Affairs with mm -hmm. stakeholder meetings with other organizations, mm -hmm. um, as well as finding ways to kind of hold leaders accountable for what they are doing. So filing a number of complaints um, and that kind of thing. Um, and we organized a huge protest through the city mm -hmm. um, in September to kind of take up space and say, you know, we feel that these people are welcome and that there are huge issues around xenophobia. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end, you know, the crux is that behind xenophobia are huge issues which affect everyone in this country. Mm -hmm. And it's high levels of unemployment and poverty. But all of this has a legacy from colonialism and uh, apartheid and you know, uh, the, uh, just the history of, of the continent itself. Uh, Ab Abigail, would you be able to give us numbers in terms of migrants in South Africa? So it is difficult statistics yes. to give. The, what we do reference is from the 2011 and 2016 community surveys. Um, so it's between 4 and 7% of the population, which is at a whole a very small proportion of the population. Mm -hmm. You're looking at mm -hmm. a minority population. when we hear politicians talk. And Johannesburg has the highest number of non-nationals in the country. Uh, so you would experience, you know, the, yeah, there's higher numbers of people in Johannesburg. Uh, because where would the majority of, of these migrants come from? I mean, we know we have uh, Nigerians, a huge Nigerian population, uh, Zimbabwean population. Would you say that that and is... The Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo. is, okay. I think, our highest asylum-seeking population. Democratic Republic of Congo. So, and from the SADC region is the highest number of migrants. Well, Abigail Dawson from the Consortium here, uh, our Consortium for Refugees and Migrants in South Africa. Thank you for joining us and for shedding some insights, uh, the plight of refugees and migrants uh, in South Africa, uh, on the continent as well. Uh, Newsworld is going to take a short break. Thank you for uh, joining us.